Let's do a bit of multipass compositing. Today is part four of my tutorial series where I take a 3D CG spaceship and bring it into live action footage. And let me quickly review what I have done so far because today everything comes together. So part one of this tutorial series, I brought in the spaceship itself and took care of this model animation, like these rotations and so on on the model and the texturing and bump map and so on. So this was part one so that I have the ship here set up. Then in part two, I took the footage, did 3D camera tracking on the footage and then built a little simple 3D scene and set up some motion path for my spaceship and brought in the, the shadow, at least in this uh, 3D CG environment. Now the colors don't match and so on, that's fine. But we have uh, in principle the ship and the shadows available. Then in the last part, I took care of the background and added a patch on the background for the landing site or takeoff site of the spaceship. So some, some burnt grass, which I painted in and tracked to the background using planar tracking. And now, of course, I want to finish this up or getting uh, towards a combined image where we have the shadow and the ship and all the passes together. So. If you haven't followed along on all parts, you can always take my solution files from the website or this, this starting file from which I am working on right now. You can download it, open it up in Fusion Studio or inside DaVinci Resolve, whichever you prefer. And when you're ready, let's dive in. As my flow here gets more complex, it's likely that I need more time for rendering. And what I like to do is render out parts of my composite that I feel confident about and that I don't want to change anymore. And I will render those parts to disk. This has the advantage, for example, if I uh, render out this part here, the background, which I think is completed now, I don't need to do, Fusion doesn't need to do the computation every time I continue working on this overall project. Same with the 3D scenes especially. You do a 3D renderer and then maybe you do more stuff afterwards in 2D, but the 3D renderer will most likely not change anymore. So I can render that to disk and then use it from disk to continue rather than having it compute every time. So that's great to do also if you think you might discontinue working on it and then open Fusion again later, then your RAM will be gone but your disk space is of course uh, still available, your disk cache. So let me set this up for the first element here for the background. I can just right click on the last node of the part of the flow which I want to keep. And here I can uh, choose cache to disk, choose a folder on my fast um, scratch space. And by default, it offers you the .raw extension, which is fine. There are some other options here. However, the only issue is you don't have the detailed settings here directly in this node. So if you want to render out to EXR, for example, uh, you can do this. But by this default option, you don't really have uh, a lot of render options. It just renders out one default setting and that's it. So if I want to render out a different file type, for example, now this raw is fine for me, I think, but if I want a different file format, uh, then I would probably use a saver node and manually save via a saver node and then load again with the loader node. But here, let me just use the default option with the default file extension, hoping that's good, um, and click OK. And that means that now as this is being rendered, even if I just uh, play it now in the preview, as this is being rendered, it also creates for each frame, it creates the files accordingly on the disk. Let me do one more thing just for organization and put some color to my flow. Um, I don't do this very often, but now I think the flow is getting a bit larger all in all. So I will just call this, make an underlay like this, call this um, background um, and just put this underlay underneath. If you like, you can also, you know, give it some some color, whatever, doesn't matter. Um, and this way I, I will stay organized throughout the flow. Now, the first thing that comes on top of this is a shadow. And the shadow I will realize simply by just using a simple brightness and contrast on this background and drive this with a mask. So what I need from my um, 3D scene is a mask which indicates where the shadow is. That's all I need. And then I can uh, implement the shadow simply with the brightness and contrast in 2D. So let me put the brightness and contrast here. 
and show you how I get the mask. So from my 3D scene, which you probably remember if you did part two of this uh, tutorial series, I already got a shadow here, which is a shadow on this ground plane. And for now, let me just remove everything else. So the markers I don't need. So the markers were these blue pins here, control P to disable or just press this. Um, then they are gone. Then I have my light, which is causing the shadow, which is great. And I have the ship here, which is just this part. And in the visibility, I can make it unseen by cameras. And this way it's still there, kind of. It's still casting the shadow, but it doesn't appear on the output from the camera. So I now have a shadow from an object which I don't see on camera, which is um, kind of cool. Okay, let me use the ground plane and make this white and fully opaque. And I don't need the input anymore. I only want the shadow here. So I can start from here. Now I have a dark shadow on a bright plane. Let me also go into the shadow settings now. And in the shadow settings, I can first of all make the shadow completely black. So instead of density 0.5, I can give it a density of one. And I can, if you want, you can increase the um, intensity of the light if you want to make this brighter, but we can also do this afterwards. Um, but this way it's like completely hard, black and white. Um, and probably I need now a better resolution here. I'm looking at it in high quality mode. And here I have a shadow map size and I can increase this now. Now this will increase the uh, render time significantly depending on how far you go. So maybe I can just multiply this by eight or so. Um, and it will now render slower, but you will get a very clean shadow. Now, since I'm only using this once, render it once, cache to disk, and from there on only use uh, the cache. Okay, now I have a black and white kind of image, which is good for a mask, but I still have transparency here, solid here, and um, some black in between. So let me do the following first. Very quickly, I merge it over white background. This way I have the whole image white, except for the foreground and this area here. And let me quickly mask this out so I get rid of this um, white, black, black stripe here. So I just have everything white and the shadow black. That's the idea. Um, quick mask. Okay, that should probably do it. And I'm just masking, uh, let me check the dimensions. I um, My background needs to match the dimensions from before, so I'm not working in HD, but in Ultra HD, so 3840 to 160. So now this is matching, and my mask is cutting out everything, that's fine. Um, so everything here is white, and then I have some gray areas here uh, from, from the spotlight, which is not illuminating at 100%, but that's not an issue at all. I'll fix that with the next tool, which is the bitmap tool. I'm using a bitmap tool to bring this. This is still an RGBA image, right? So I still have all channels here, but I only need the mask. So the bitmap tool can transform a black and white image into a mask image. So bitmap tool it is. Bitmap, here it comes. Let me attach it. And here I can choose the luminance or any color channel, doesn't matter. And now I have only an alpha channel as the output from the bitmap. You don't see that, but later the data type and the way Fusion uses this uh, going forward is, is different. So this way I restrict myself to mask only. And in addition, I have some operations here like a low and high threshold, which is quite convenient because I can directly use it to get rid of this gray area. I just bring the right point down um, to get rid of these um, semi-transparent uh, kind of areas or grayscale values and just make sure I have a pure black and white image. This black is also not 100% black, so I can just mm, bring this uh, up a bit and this way I have indeed a pure black and white mask. I will also invert it so that I am masking the shadow rather than masking everything around the shadow. And this way, if I use this bitmap now, I can use it as a mask on my brightness and contrast down here. And let's see, here is my background. And if I want a shadow, all I need to do is reduce the gain. So this way I have my shadow back in.
just reducing the brightness of the image in the area that I have masked out from above. Um, the gain you can judge by the existing shadow. So here in the beginning, the spaceship is just starting off. It's just touching the ground. So similarly, it should be similarly dark to the shadow at the bottom of uh, this wind turbine here, for example. So here you see very dark shadow. So if I compare this, I think it should get pretty far down. So we have very little ambient light and very strong effect from, from the sunlight. So shadow here is dark here as well. So you can start with a very dark shadow. Um, but then as the ship lifts off the ground and is higher in the air, um, you might think that the shadow maybe also uh, reduces in intensity. So if I go somewhere here, uh, where the shadow is coming from the ship, like flying just in front of us. Maybe a better reference is like here, these, these tops from the wind turbine, and you see that it's not as dark as here. So if, if the object is further away, you have more ambient light affecting it, and the shadows get, on the one hand, um, less dark, so they get a bit lighter and also potentially a bit softer. So we can simulate both of this. So first of all, the color or the, the brightness. So I might animate this and reduce, make it a bit lighter. And then I can also think about the softness of the shadow. And this I do with a simple blur. So I'll just add a blur in here. So I just bring a blur into the flow. And in the beginning, on frame zero, uh, I, I will just look again at the shadow. So it's pretty hard, right, uh, as far as the image is concerned. So if I have at all a blur, then just just be very soft blur. It also helps get rid of anti, any um, remaining aliasing problems that we have from the shadow resolution. So it's also nice in that way, but again, just a little bit. Otherwise, if you still see zigzag lines, and I still see it a bit here, um, I might go back and increase the shadow resolution even more, like the shadow map size, then you could get rid of this. Um, but for now, I'm, maybe I do this um, afterwards and then render it if I have, let's see how fast it renders. Um, I, can, I can do this, but just a bit of blur is, is also okay, I think. Uh, and then again, I can animate the parameter and towards the end, somewhere, I don't know, frame 300 or so, um, when it's getting out, I think it should match more like, should feel much softer, like the tips here of, of the wind turbine, like that's maybe a similar distance between ground and shadow. And I can bring the blur up a bit to uh, match this. So you can refine it a bit more, maybe judge it later together with the ship, add more keyframes, and I will put it on the disk same way as before, just put the cache to disk just on this bitmap, and this way I can efficiently continue using this uh, throughout the rest of the work. Okay, so now I can cache it to disk, and I can also organize this a little bit. Let me just add an underlay like I did before. And then afterwards, no change here in the flow. It's the same as you have just seen, just uh, a little bit visually separated. So background, then my shadow, which is coming together here through the blur and brightness and contrast. And then I can already add the next merge. The next element is, of course, the ship itself, which will come in. I will do the ship in at least two passes. If you want, you can even split it out further. Um, but the two passes that I want to do is uh, one where I have the, the diffuse and specular highlights and all the um, regular color properties and light properties of the ship. And then I will do a separate pass for the, the active lights of the ship, the, these engine lights, the emissions from the ship. And I do that separately so that I can in 2D blur these lights or add some glow or stuff like this. So I can do uh, 2D operations separately on those. Um, if you want, you can separate it further than this. You can, for example, render out a shadow pass and a specular pass and, and so on. And you will see in a minute how that goes if you want to do this. Um, and I think 
since we are working entirely in Fusion and we are not importing complete passes from 3D, uh, I think this makes sense if you intend to do 2D manipulations on them. If not, you can also directly do it in 3D and then render it out once and keep it combined. So how much you split up really depends on um, what you want to do with it in the next step. So less talking, more doing. Let's go in. And the ship is up here. I will quickly group this stuff together. So these are all the different parts of the ship. I'm no longer worried about this. It's all set up fine. But I do keep the materials separately here. And let's bring this above the last stuff that we did here. And here I will just copy and paste this whole part. Uh, I don't need the bitmap and that stuff. I just need the 3D scene. And actually I also no longer need the ground plane. I don't need the markers. I just need the scene. And I will now replace, this was the, the dummy ship model here, uh, just one part of this model. This I will now replace with the, with the full ship. So let me delete this and bring in the the full model. And now I have here, I have my full spaceship model in my 3D scene without the ground plane and the markers and so on. So I just have uh, the ship itself. And you see here, this is on a relatively late frame. You see the ship is bright from where the spotlight comes and completely black from underneath. Um, if you wanted to, you could render it out like this, but I also want some ambient light. So let me attach this as well under the spotlight or besides the spotlight, I add some ambient light. So the ambient light is like the constant surrounding fill light from all directions. And then I, I get this. And before I adjust much, let me already merge it in. Somewhere down here was a merge node. And I hate these lines which are going anywhere. Uh, you, I just press Alt and get this piping tool here just to clean up the directions. So this way it's very clean. Uh, from here I get my ship and it's merging into my overall scene here. So let's look at this on the right and the ship alone on the left. And now you can think about how strong the specularity should be, how strong the ambient light should be, and so on. Let me go to the beginning of the scene, where I think it's, it's easiest to judge. So if I look at shadows here and at this truck, for example, now that's all very much zoomed in. But still, you see uh, you have very dark areas where the shadows are and very strong light. So overall, the sunlight is really dominating in the scene. So I really want the spotlight to be strong. And underneath, um, it can really get, get dark. So I think this is too much ambient light. I definitely want to reduce that. So maybe just use half the ambient light or even less. Now, that's really a judgment call. So you can really decide how far you want to reduce this. And maybe you also want to animate this again so that when it's on the ground, there's least light which is coming like from underneath and which is being reflected. So I might animate this here. And then at the end, when it's like flying completely through the scene, uh, then ambient light is coming from all directions and from the sky and so on. So I might increase this a little bit. Now, I did get a question recently, how about a uh, light is, that is really reflected from the ground. Of course, ambient light is the light that like comes from all around, uh, but it doesn't actually calculate accurate reflection from the image itself. So if you are familiar with Blender or Maya or full 3D suits, they may have a global illumination model and have options for image-based lighting as well. So you can, you can actually say, OK, I have a beige ground, so and light should reflect from that ground, or some portion of the light should come back and should light the scene again. Now, Fusion doesn't have that sophisticated uh, rendering options here available. So in Fusion, you're basically restricted to the lights that that you have available. Um, what I would do in this case, now for very sophisticated scenarios, uh, 
you may need to go to a full 3D application, don't render from Fusion. That would be one solution. For a simple scenario like this, if you see the shadow and you see there's hardly any light coming in the darker areas or not much, and also the ground is very even, so you don't have like strong reflecting parts or so that shine back onto the image, onto the ship. So if you have a scenario like this, you could maybe get away with just by using ambient light and spotlights and changing the color a little bit and maybe manually adjusting it so that it fits. So if you do feel that on from the beige field, there should be some beige color cast coming back onto the ship, um, which I think would be minimal in, in an image like this because of the strong sunlight from the top. But if you still think there should be a little bit, uh, what you could do is go into the ambient light and then um, maybe select some, some color here from, from the field. Uh, that didn't work. Ah, now I have it. Um, so select uh, some, some tone from, from the field, bring it up lightly, and then, you know, actually you can, can see here between white and so you can hardly see it, but it does make a little bit of an impact. So if you think the light is not entirely white that is coming from underneath, um, I could adjust it like this. Now, technically, this would now uh, also cast this tone from on all around the ship, right? Not just from the area below, which is reflecting. So if I want to drive this even further and I'm really having doubts that anybody will see that. But if I, if I really want to bring this further, I can uh, use the spotlight to compensate for the effect of the ambient light. So, I mean, just a little bit of color trickery here. Uh, so if I just look at any color wheel, so let's look here at the color wheel from a color corrector. Uh, so we have the field is like beige orange. The complementary color on the opposite side would like be a light blue tone. So if I want to, I can now go into the spotlight and maybe give the spotlight a minimal blue cast to compensate for the beige from the uh, ambient light. But because the spotlight is so much stronger than, than the ship, I think this is like, would be like hardly anything that, that you would notice anyways. So, but just as a general idea, if you do have stronger reflecting lights, um, you do not have this global illumination model or the more advanced rendering tools that you have in some 3D applications, but there's still a little bit in a compositing sense that, you know, where you can adjust colors and set up lights that, that simulate part of this. So that's just my, my takeaway from this. Um, what I can do more accurately and think about more is things like the uh, reflective parts of this uh, ship and the specularity. So if I go back into the material, I have here my diffuse and my specular color. If you do want to treat those in 2D, for example, you could add some glow to specular highlights, for example. If, if that's something you wanted to do, then you can uh, render them out separately. So for example, if I, if I just want the diffuse color, I can just uh, set the specular color to black, um, and then there's no specularity on, on, my, on my spaceship here. So this is now completely flat. If I set that, if I increase the intensity, the specularity is back, and I could set the diffuse color to black. So in this case, I get purely a specular highlight uh, output. And I can use this as a separate render pass if I do want to treat them in 2D, if I want to add some glow or something. Um, I think I don't need to do this in this scenario. I will just keep it in 3D for these parts and we'll just adjust it directly here. Since I can jump back and forth, I can see how it looks like and directly adjust it. So if I look at the specular highlights here, and look at similar highlights here. So maybe I can, maybe they can shine a bit more, I think, and maybe a little bit wider just by comparison. So I might just go again into the specular highlights here and perhaps increase the play a bit with the, the exponent and see. So if I bring this a bit down, I'm going at blurring it a bit further. So again, just to look at it, what's happening here. So here you see in see purely what's happening with the exponent. So it's focusing the specular highlights or blurring them out a bit, giving them a bit more intensity, a bit more spread. And so I think I will, will keep it like this so that these parts are kind of blown out. Okay, so overall I am now happy with the diffuse pass and with my specular highlights. And 
What I am not 100% happy with are the shadows and the motion blur, which doesn't exist as of now. And I will now show you some 2D tricks how I can get ambient occlusion, which is one type of shadow basically, and motion blur, which I can get those in 2D from this 3D renderer. Um, and what I need for this are additional output channels and let's go through it step by step. So here this uh, camera tracker one renderer, this is the renderer from my 3D scene and for now it's just giving me the RGBA output. Let me also enable Z, normal and vector. And the normal path uh, Z and normal pass I can use to calculate the ambient occlusion. There is a tool called ambient occlusion, ambient occlusion, and what it does, it takes the 2D information about the surface of the ship, so the normal direction, which just says in each pixel in which direction is the surface of that pixel pointing if it was still in 3D, so it's like a 3D output into 2D um, and it is using that information together with the camera position which I have here. Here's my camera. If I attach both the output here and the camera then it's using this information to calculate shadows basically. Um, and by shadows I mean the areas in which less ambient light is hitting the surface of the ship. So if you have tight corners, um, covered up areas, occluded areas, so that's the, the name of ambient occlusion. So you have these areas where not as much light from all directions shines in and those areas, um, there you have shadows. So if I just reduce the radius, this is like the most important setting here, uh, samples is regarding the resolution, radius, um, is controlling how it is calculated, then you see here, you see shadows coming in. And this is being calculated entirely in 2D now, which is very efficient. Uh, calculating ambient occlusion as a real 3D effect is, well, it's not supported out of the box in Fusion, and it's also one of the more uh, rendering intensive 3D tasks. So even if you do it in a 3D application, it takes time to compute, but here in 2D it's very efficient. Um, so I'm using this and I'm using this now pretty much the same way I used the shadow mask before and I this is still an image, this is just a grayscale image, so if I want I can just add a bitmap tool, a bitmap tool to it where I can use the luminance as my alpha output. Okay, let's invert this and it's now white outside, but that's fine, that's okay. I just need the inner area from the ship and I'm using this again to drive a brightness and contrast. So let me bring a brightness and contrast in here, connect the mask and in my brightness and contrast now, if I reduce the gain again, you should see a bit what's happening. Yeah, so you see it here in these areas. So if I just on off, especially in these corners, you see the difference. And now how strong it should be and so on, you can, you have full control of course on the one end you have here the, the gain or even, even gamma control if you want and on the other hand you have this map here, this occlusion map kind of, where you can via the kernel radius, you know, you have some uh, control how this shadow should be like. If you want, there are even options, for example, to use uh, multiple tools, multiple ambient occlusion tools with different kernel radius and then merge those together so you can um, get some very strong shadows in the inner corners and then something softer which extends. So things like this, there's a lot that you can play around with. Here it's a very subtle effect, so I don't really want to overdo it, especially in such strong light conditions where we don't have that much ambient light. Um, but you see the effect is here and it does add a little bit of realism, I feel. Okay, this was the ambient occlusion. Um, next part, motion blur. And this is again an effect which I want to do in 2D. You can do it in 3D by using the accumulation effects from the OpenGL renderer. Again, these are effects which are great to have but also cost intensive to compute. So rather than doing it in 3D, I will use the vector output here uh, to calculate it in 2D. So the tool for this is called vector motion blur or vector, yeah, vector motion blur. 
which is a 2D tool which uses vector information from the 3D renderer. Now, vector information, let's have a look at it. So if I go to the output, you have here, you see all the different technical channels that I'm outputting. So Z is the, the distance, is a black and white channel. Normals give the normal directions, the orientation of each part of the surface. This was used for the ambient occlusion. And then vector gives the speed and direction, so the velocity vector of each pixel in the image from the 3D space. So as the ship is, so in the beginning it's basically stationary, right? And then as it's moving, you see the color changes. And here you see the, the color of this vector um, in each pixel tells in which direction the pixel is, is moving. So here it's spinning a bit and you know, moving forward. And this information can be used to accurately uh, compute motion blur in 2D. Let me go into uh, the vector motion blur here. And maybe I should again uh, have a look at it, not just in isolation, but in combination with, the, um, with my final image. So let me look into the merge. Uh, and you see here, I, I still have to do some masking later, but I don't worry about this right now. Um, so I'm only worried about the ship. And while it's, while it's parked, first of all, I see practically no blur from, from the motion, which is fine. And then I think it's fastest like at the end when it's just in front of the camera. We have the, the strongest motion. And here you see a bit of blur. And now you can judge if you think uh, it should be a bit more, a bit less. Uh, the image itself doesn't really give a lot of reference to this other than that we do have camera movement from the drone. But I don't think you will really see motion blur in the original image. Um, at least it's hard to um, analyze this. So if I look in the original background image, motion blur would mean so the drone is moving to the side, I think, and a bit inwards. So it would mean that, for example, if you look at a turbine here, that to the, to the side in the direction of the movement should see a bit more blur here compared to like up and down, like below and above. But I think it's hard to see that here at all. So I don't think that the camera is producing a lot of uh, motion blur. It's very subtle, if, if at all. Um, however, the, the ship here uh, does have it moves much faster than the drone, so I think it's reasonable to have some motion blur on the ship. And now we have a simple slider where we can decide how, how much motion blur there should be. So we have this, this scale slider, and now it's set to 1, which is, I think, already good. And if you want like a more dramatic effect on this, you can increase this a bit, maybe 1.5. You see that in the direction of the motion, or even, I mean, if you fully want to exaggerate it, that's just, just for, you know, then you get like, really strong motion blur. Um, I think that's that's not realistic, but um, a smaller value, uh, you can, can judge how much is, is maybe, maybe interesting. All right, so we have used the normal passes and the vector passes to get 2D effects for things that would otherwise be more difficult and more compute intensive to generate from 3D. So we have the motion blur and the ambient occlusion, and this is already created in. Okay, now I have my all my main render passes together. I've put it into one orange underlay box here and set up the disk cache on the last node. But I have set it up before the vector motion blur. And the reason is that the next element I'm creating should also be affected by the vector motion blur. At least that's my logic, and you will see in a minute why. The next element I'm creating, I'm adding the lights of the ship. And basically, I can copy a good portion of what I have done here. Um, we have here this uh, luminance emission map. This is the map which I have not used initially. And so far, it's not connected. I'm not using it so far. But this is what I am rendering now. So let me copy all this, including the render nodes, but not the, um, I don't need the ambient occlusion now. I just need the lights, nothing about shadows. OK, now I have set up a very simple render output, which renders very quickly and which only gives me the lights of this ship. And from this, I can now merge them into the main scene. So my main renderer here from my um, orange uh, underlay area, I can merge it in there. 
let me add directly a merge in between here and I add it before the motion blur so that my lights are also affected by the same motion blur. That's the idea. So let me connect this. And of course, this doesn't work. So this is the normal apply mode. So right now it's just adding the black image on top. And of course, I don't want it just added. I just want the lights and the lights are the brightest parts and they can uh, they come through if I use the screen mode as apply mode. So this will uh, screen, which means take the brightest areas and uh, merge them over and ignore the dark areas. So the black is ignored and the lights come through. Now we come to the reason why I have uh, rendered this part out separately because now I want to use some glows in 2D on the lights specifically and treat them separately. So on uh, immediately after my output here, I can add now a soft glow, for example, soft glow. And I can, by default, you see immediately what's happening. I am just glowing uh, these lights. So I just add glow to the lights here. Uh, without glowing other areas like the specular highlights, for example, from the ship. Looks almost good, but actually not exactly. You see here that there's some gray areas or black areas coming in. And the reason is the way the glow works. So right now it's a general glow on top of the whole thing. Um, what is much better is to restrict the glow to the highlights. So you can either work with a threshold parameter or you can create yourself a mask for the lights to make sure that only the lights are creating glow and nothing else in the image. So the mask is, I think, the more visible way. So again, bitmap tool is our friend to get images into masks. So I just use a bitmap tool from my render output here. And this bitmap tool, now I choose the luminance channel. And here you see just from the luminance, I just get the bright areas of the lights and nothing else. And I can even increase this, crop it down uh, with the right point. And this way I'm restricting now my blur. Let me connect this by alt clicking. I see the options and I want to use this as the glow mask. So the glow mask is not the difference is the effect mask is where everywhere the glow can happen. The glow mask is where the source of the glow is. So this way I'm restricting my uh, soft glow effect to the areas where uh, which shall be glowing. So nothing else uh, should glow. Only these areas should glow, but the glow expands beyond the masked out area. So I still have the same type of glow, but I'm restricting it to the lights. So that's the idea here. Um, and I have successfully done that. And if you want, you can play around with the parameters. Uh, sometimes glows can also be nice in sequence. So maybe sometimes you make a glow with, with a very narrow glow size to have like a very strong glow for the inner parts, maybe something like this. And then you can add a second glow or soft glow. So you can try soft glow as a bit softer as the, the other glow. So then you can experiment with different glow sizes and add glows to each other, for example. And this way you, you have very fine control and can um, do a lot of nice effects on, on, on the glow. I will not overdo this here because that's basically just the, the fine tuning, but the idea is here. And this way now I have the lights added. I have my full ship model with the shadows, with the occlusion. I have my shadow here. I have my, my background patch. I basically have everything together. The only thing I need to do um, now to, to get to a final version is I need to um, mask out here this uh, the turbine. I think I won't even show that. That's too simple. You know how to create a simple mask. Um, what I will do now is, besides that, I will let all my cache fill up while having a longer extensive coffee break and let it just render. And when that's done, then I can still do any fine tuning, right? So if I want a bit more glow, a bit less glow, for example, on the lights, all that's impacted is the light renderer and everything else remains the same. Or if I want the shadow a little bit less intense or a little bit more, I can go into the sliders, bring it up, bring it down. So all these kinds of adjustments I can do without doing any 3D rendering all the time. So that's the idea of the setup. And uh, that's the idea of having control over individual passes. And I hope that idea came through in this tutorial. All right, with a little bit of fine tuning, here is my render result. I think that's pretty close to what I had in mind. I still want to do one more part where I want to add a little bit of dust into the scene, which maybe helps the realism a little bit. If you think there are other things missing which I should do on the scene, if there's anything 
you feel uh, you want to know or anything that was unclear in the series so far, just let me know in the comments and I try to accommodate for it. Otherwise, we are getting to the finish line with this tutorial series. Okay, thanks for watching. My name is Bernd. See you in the last part next week.